when Christmas time rolls around as it has now for us. It seems like we preachers get into a scolding mood. Have you heard us scold you? Here's what happens. We watch as the season heats up. We watch as the trees go up, the lights go on, the carols play. We watch as people shop. Used to be at the mall, occasionally still is, I guess. A lot of it from clicking on websites like Amazon. We watch all the giving and the getting, especially. We watch the consumerism and the debt. We watch the greed and the stress. And that's when we start scolding. We tell you, folks, Jesus is the reason for the season. There was a pastor in Shreveport, Louisiana, who understood that very well, Pastor Chris Dolson, who at the time of this writing was pastoring a church there. I want you to listen to how he captured the essence of that kind of a Christmas season. Dolson writes, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from the U.S. Treasury that all of America should go shopping. And this decree was first made when the leading economic indicators dipped to their lowest point, and all went out to shop, each to their own mall. And a Christian also went up from his suburban home to the city with its many malls because he wanted to prove he was from the household of prosperity. And with him was his wife, who was great with economic worry. And so it was that while they were there, they found many expensive presents pudgy-faced dolls, trucks that turn into robots, and a various assortment of video games. And the woman wrote checks for those they could afford and charged the rest on many different kinds of plastic cards. She wrapped the presents in bright paper and laid them in the garage, for there was no room for them in her closet. And there were in the same country children keep, keeping watch over their stockings by night. And little Santa Claus came upon them, and they were sore afraid, expecting to see special effects they had seen in movies. And Santa said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people who can afford this holiday. For unto you will be given this day in your suburban home great feast of turkey, dressing, and cake, and many presents. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the presents wrapped in bright paper, paper, lying beneath an artificial tree adorned with tinsel, colored balls, and lights. And suddenly there was with Santa Claus a multitude of relatives and friends praising one another and saying, Glory to you for getting me this gift. It's just what I wanted. And it came to pass. As the friends and relatives were gone away into their homes, the parents said to one another, I'm sure glad that's over. What a mess. I'm too tired to clean it up. Let's go to bed and pick it up tomorrow. And when they had said this, they remembered the statement that had been told to them by the shopkeepers. Christmas comes only once a year. And they that heard it wondered at those things that were told them by the shopkeepers. But the children treasured all their things in their hearts, hoarding their toys from each other. And the parents, after a drink, went to bed, glorifying and praising each other for all the bargains they had found in the stores. I think Dolson had it right. No wonder we preachers scold. Jesus is the reason for the season. But then you go home, you pick up your Bible, you turn to the stories in the gospel accounts, you read the story of that first Christmas, you turn over to the pages of Paul's writings, you peruse those passages dealing with the great exchange. And as you do so, as you scrutinize, as you examine, as you ponder and wonder, a stunning realization dawns. And here's the realization. You are the reason for the season. You. Now, I know Jesus is the reason for the season. I get that when we're standing against the crass commercialism of Christmas. But when we're talking about the theology 
of Christmas. You are the reason for the season. Isn't that why Jesus left his throne on high and came down to earth and reached into the gutter of sin and saved us? C.S. Lewis tried to capture that in this way, deeply meaningful words, where he said this, One may think of a diver reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green and warm water into the black and cold water, down through the increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay, and then back up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting until suddenly he breaks the surface again, holding in his hand the dripping, precious thing he went down to recover. That dripping, precious thing is you. And Advent is when we celebrate his coming down to us. You are the reason for the season. And that's what in this series we've been calling the Great Exchange. Today we're considering His riches for our poverty. To do so, we go to 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the church in ancient Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. It's a magnificent section of Scripture, those two chapters. Those two chapters contain the most robust, words that Paul ever writes about the act of Christian giving. He's in the process of finalizing his collection for the saints from the churches around his then-known world for the needy saints in Jerusalem, and he's writing to his Corinthian friends to urge them to finish their gift. These two chapters are filled with memorable words. Various different verses are worth lingering over. In fact, just where he starts is an example. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2, this is what Paul writes. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I find that to be maybe the most amazing passage on human giving to be found in the Bible. I mean, did you consider the elements that Paul includes here? He starts out with severe trial. When was the last time you were in severe trial? Did your thoughts turn outward? Not mine. This past week, I had a toothache, the likes of which I don't think I've had in my life. It made me, well, I'll tell you what it did. The pain was so intense, I had no thought for people out there. What are their concerns? What are their, what are their needs? My thoughts turned inward. Who can help me? I am so profoundly grateful to our physicians and dentists. I'm sitting here today because of them. Severe trial. That's the first ingredient. And then Paul says another ingredient he adds is extreme poverty. Extreme. He uses a strong word there. It means the most, the most glowing, significant, large example of something. They are extremely poor. You know what I'm saying. Scraping off the bottom of the barrel poor. Where are we going to eat tonight poor? Where are we going to sleep tonight poor? That kind of poor. Extremely poor. It's understandable. They had survived three wars. They were persecuted. They were ostracized. And the people who were following Jesus already came from the lower echelons of society. Extreme poverty. It's as though he's poured those two ingredients into the blender. And now he adds one more. You have to have something to temper those difficult experiences. So now it says he adds overflowing joy. I don't know where that came from. But he puts that in as well. Puts the top on and hits the button that says blend. And it begins to blend until suddenly the top pops off and something wells up out from outside of what has been mixing. And what is that? 
You saw it there. Rich generosity. Would you explain that to me? How in the world do you have severe trial and extreme poverty? And then where does overflowing joy come from? And then to have it all together well up in rich generosity, stunning. Maybe the most memorable passage on human giving in the Bible. That's here in these two chapters. There's another verse, short verse. You remember it from childhood. This one in chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Remember that? In the kids' classes at church, God loves a cheerful giver. But this is not a passage for those who are immature in heart and soul. This is a passage that speaks to our very attitude in giving. Do you know what it's saying? It's saying you keep giving as long as you can keep smiling. When you stop smiling, stop giving. Because God values the gift of the one who smiles while doing it. There's another memorable passage, just a verse long. Pardon me, very short verse. It's the last verse in the entire section. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. Paul uses a word here that appears nowhere else in the New Testament. Some have even said Paul coined this word. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, it says this, Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Indescribable. Paul doesn't even know how to capture it. There's just verse after verse in this section of 2 Corinthians that is memorable, compelling. And please understand, these are not just words on a page. Paul isn't filling space. He's expecting his readers to live this out. He's drawing on the ethic of Jesus. You know, the Jesus who said things like, the one who has received much must give much. The one who said, freely you have received, freely give. Paul's expecting that here. But so is Jesus. In fact, Jesus not only expects it, Jesus lives it. He had much, so he gave much. Paul captures that. Summarizing maybe these, this entire section of these two chapters in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, where he says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The great exchange. Pondering that passage had me thinking about riches and poverty. And it got me to wondering, how do you know if you're rich? Seems like the answer should be fairly obvious, doesn't it? You have a lot of possessions. Maybe you have a big bank account. Maybe you have a great salary. Seems like those would be the ways you would know you were rich. But I was curious if there were other ways, and so I sat down and typed into my Google search bar, how does one know one is rich? There were a whole range of articles that came up suggesting different things. For example, one, I'll read this one to you. One suggested there are five signs to know you're rich. You don't carry a lot of debt. You can live comfortably below your means. You can save easily. You're going to be able to afford to retire as planned. You aren't stuck. Ooh, that makes it a little bit more challenging, doesn't it? Maybe it reframes the answer we give to that question, how do I know if I'm rich? 
But there was one article that really caught my eye. It caught my eye because it made this claim. The answer to one question will tell you whether or not you're rich. Well, that caught my eye. I wanted to know what that one question was. It came from Derek Saul, S-A-L-L. Derek Saul, a personal financial blogger, personal financial specialist, Derek Saul, who paid off $116,000 of debt in seven years and now is helping others to learn about finances. Well, Saul says there's one question, the answer to which will tell you whether or not you're rich. And here's the question. Here's the question. If your income is cut off, how long can you survive? If it's cut off, how long can you survive? Saul says, you can drive a $40,000 BMW, live in a $500,000 home, but if you're $600,000 in debt, you're not any better off than a seven-year-old. He developed a scale to help us know whether or not we're rich. So here's the scale. He says, if you can survive less than a month, if your income is cut off, you are broke, no matter how much you make. Some people make a lot of money but are in debt up to their eyeballs. Less than a month, you're broke. One to three months, you're teetering. You're teetering on the edge of collapse. Three to six months, satisfactory. Six months to two years, now you're getting into the range of being well off. Two to five years, you're wealthy. Five or more years, you are ultra wealthy. How do you know if you're rich? Well, you know by how long you can live. When that which you deeply value and need is cut off. And it's right there that we intersect with the great exchange. Because I want you to think about Jesus. You know the Jesus I'm talking about. The Jesus that Scripture tells us is the Creator God. The Jesus from whom the created planet spun pristine and pure. The Jesus whom the psalmist refers to as God talking about God, it would be this Jesus when he said, with the Lord, a year, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. Time is immaterial. The Jesus uh, who owns the Cadillacs on a thousand freeways. The Jesus who is the Lord over all creation. The Jesus who has all the created order at his beck and call. The Jesus to whom the creatures and the beings in Revelation cry out, Worthy is the Lamb. He is worthy to receive power and honor and glory and riches and blessing and might and praise. That Jesus. Do you know that over in Ephesians, Paul tells us, speaking of that Jesus, that his glorious inheritance, that which gives him great wealth, is the saints, his people, us. That, says Paul, is what makes up his glorious riches. And so our question for Jesus is Derek Saul's question. Jesus, how long can you survive if that is cut off? You know, by sin, by death, you are separated from these beings you have created. How long can you survive? Then we'll know just how rich you are. And Jesus 
Jesus, for reasons that escape my comprehension, but for reasons for which I will praise him throughout the ages of eternity, says, decides, I can't live without them. Not a day. The moment Jesus makes that decision, he is poor, abjectly poor. He can't survive by his own decision beyond today without you. Do you realize how upside down that is? Philip Ryken, an academic administrator, scholar, currently president of Wheaton College, in a presentation said, if you have a kingdom, everything goes into protecting the king. That's what matters most. That's what the game of chess is built on. If you've ever played chess, with the rooks, the pawns, the queens, the bishops, you know that the one you are striving to protect at all costs is the king. D-Day, June 6, 1944, Operation Overlord, would be a turning point in the war. Winston Churchill made the decision that he would oversee it in person. He said, I will stand on the bridge of the HMS Belfast, and I will be there in person to oversee and to observe. His military leader said to him, oh no, Mr. Prime Minister, you cannot do that. It will be far too dangerous. I'm going to do it, he said. Obstinate as a bulldog. They tried everything they could to talk him out of it. He would not budge till they finally appealed to a higher authority. King George VI. King George, this is what he's going to do. King George intervened. You cannot do that, Mr. Prime Minister. Even to the king, Churchill would not budge. Until finally the king backed down and said, Okay. Well, if you're going, I'm going to. I will stand beside you on that bridge. And it was then that Churchill knew he had been defeated. He could not endanger the king. And yet, that's what Jesus did because he decided that he couldn't live a day without you, he turned everything upside down, and the one who was rich became poor because he couldn't live a day beyond that without you. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, says Paul, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. But the verse doesn't end there. It goes on to say that through his poverty, you might be made rich. So how does that work? Remember what Paul says in the verse. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus came down, as C.S. Lewis said, diving into that water, going all the way down into the ooze and the slime and the muck to recover that which was of greatest value to him, he brought with him abundant grace, stunning grace, amazing grace. In fact, he poured so much grace over us that we are swimming in it, immersed in it, almost drowning in his grace. It's there at every step of the journey with Jesus. It was there in the beginning. 
It's there for you today if you haven't started. Grace is there at the beginning, cleansing and forgiving and restoring. In fact, this very Paul who writes these words over in 1 Corinthians makes one of his lists, he does this often, one of his lists of honestly despicable sinners. He writes that, and one might be tempted to get haughty and say, well, I'm not that. But Paul finishes that, finishes that list by saying, and such were some of you. Key word in that phrase is were. Such were some of you. Because grace has immersed you in the forgiving, regenerating power of God. It was there at the beginning of the journey. It can be there at the beginning of that journey for you today. But it's there as we take the journey. It is grace that feeds and nurtures the growing, developing, maturing Christian as he or she walks with Jesus. It's grace. That's what Paul says in Galatians. To those Galatians, he says, that grace that started you out on the journey, are you now going to accomplish it under your own might? Seriously? It was grace at the beginning, and it is grace that nurtures and fuels and empowers growth and transformation, victory over temptation, the overcoming of sin. It is grace all the way. Abundant grace. And it will be grace at the end. When the skies unfold and that great and glorious God in the person of his Son, on the cloud, arrives with a stunning host of heaven. When evil and sin flee from his presence, he is the God whom the writer of the letter to the Hebrews says is a consuming fire. But while everybody is running, you and I will look at him face to face and be able to say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. The only way we can do that will be because of grace. It is there at every step of the journey from beginning to end, and we are swimming in the abundance of his amazing grace. And that's why, that's why I really only want to tell you one thing today. It's a couple of sentences long, yes, but I really only want to tell you one thing, and that's this. Jesus became objectively poor because he couldn't live another day without you. So now you have become filthy rich because you don't have to live another day without him. And that, my friends, that is the great exchange.